down economics is the uh, uh, what they what they say neoliberalism is supposed to deliver um, trickle down wealth to everybody else. But the reality is trickle down economics has been an absolute uh, catastrophe. When you consider that in this country, which is the fifth biggest economy in the world, uh, we've got 14 million people living in poverty. And whilst neoliberalism that was brought in by Margaret Thatcher in 1979 has enriched the already incredibly wealthy, it's actually done the opposite for everybody else in, in the country. We've seen jobs being offshored to low wage economies. Our manufacturing base has been decimated. Heavy industries like uh, coal and steel have been all but uh, destroyed. And uh, we've seen uh, really a, a situation that uh, is uh, totally unacceptable uh, and one that I think we need to challenge. And that's what we're going to be discussing this evening. Regrettably, I say we've had it for 40 years, even when New Labour came into power in 1997. They embraced the kind of neoliberal consensus. And so there wasn't any real substantial shift away from the uh, neoliberal uh, parameters that were put in train by 18 years of conservative rule. Margaret Thatcher came into office in 1979, bedazzled by the likes of uh, Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman, who were the uh, high priests of uh, neoliberalism. And it's interesting that the way in which, you know, the modern sort of uh, viewpoints can change uh, because back in 1947, the people who subscribed to the kind of neoliberal uh, economic ideology uh, were seen as completely wacky and uh, they had to form a secret society called the Mont Pelerin Society, where they kind of met and uh, sort of plotted a, a, a brave new world. And it was only really when uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, as I say, came to power in 1979 during the 1970s, the, the new right had uh, uh, gained ascendancy in the Conservative Party. And, you know, uh, they uh, were able to get uh, a foothold, as it were, initially. And then ultimately, the post-war consensus was scrapped by uh, that Conservative regime when it came into office uh, at the end of the 1970s. But uh, what we saw, though, in... Uh, Latin America really was the, uh, the sort of a proving ground really, if you like, for neoliberalism. It was inflicted at the point of a gun uh, in the 1970s, places like Chile under Pinochet, um, sort of brought in a very close uh, friend and ally of, of Margaret Thatcher. And uh, it was a few years later that we saw uh, Britain, the United States and indeed the rest of the world uh, applying the same sort of principles that have been so disastrous in Latin America. And this is where our two speakers come into this evening, because both of them are uh, experts in their field and have specialised in uh, Latin America uh, and uh, studying the resistance to uh, globalisation and, uh, and neoliberalism. And the first of which is uh, John McAvoy. And uh, John's an independent journalist who's worked, uh, whose work's been published in various media outlets, including the International History Review, The Canary, Tribune Magazine, Declassified UK, uh, Jacobin, and uh, various others as well. He's uh, reported from Venezuela during the coup efforts in 2019, from Colombia during the student protests the same year, and from France in 2020 about the Yellow Vest movement and the general strike. John's main research focus is contemporary British involvement in Latin America, notably British state intervention and natural resource extraction in Colombia since 1989. So John's going to speak for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we will introduce uh, George, who will speak for 10, 15 minutes as well, and then we'll open the floor to questions from viewers. So over to you, John. Hi, Chris. Hi, George. Um, cheers for having me on today. And um, yeah, so what, what I want to speak about today is just a brief outline of, you know, how Britain has contributed um, to this legacy of neoliberalism and uh, you know, British contribution to the destruction of social organisations throughout Latin America um, over the past 60, 70 years. Um, and, you know, of course, British involvement in Latin America isn't especially well known, um, particularly in comparison to the Middle East, you know, which, is, um, which has been no doubt more significant. But that's not to say that British involvement in Latin America hasn't been quite uh, substantive. So, um, yeah, just to, just to fly through some some kind of serious episodes throughout the 20th century. As you mentioned, the Heath government supported the coup in Chile um, against Salvador Allende in 1973. 
Um, and you know the Pinochet, uh, the Pinochet regime, with uh, a great deal of support from various British governments, uh, would go on to disappear and torture thousands of leftists and opponents. Um, and at the time, behind closed doors, British diplomats were saying things like, you know, the extent of the bloodshed here has shocked people, yet we still have enough, and I quote, um, at stake in economic relations with Chile to require good relations with the government in power. So this is a theme that just continues throughout the 70s, 80s and 90s in Latin America. Um, what is good for business um, is usually um, good for Britain, regardless of kind of um, the, the consequent, the human rights consequences. Um, and you, you saw um, a similar kind of situation during the Brazilian dictatorship um, between 1964 and 1985. So notably, in 1972, declassified files show that the UK was training the Brazilian military in torture techniques. And the Thatcher government also uh, was discussing arms sales with the Argentinian hunter um, just days before the Falklands War began in uh, 1982. Um, and once again, human rights considerations uh, were totally disbanded in this situation. Uh, the human rights organizations now think as many as 30,000 people were disappeared um, throughout, throughout this um, regime that, that, that received a lot of support from the British government. Um, so, I mean, yeah, as I said, throughout these cases, human rights issues are generally, you know, they usually only arise as a point of annoyance among diplomats and, um, and foreign office officials. And, you know, UK business, commercial interests, et cetera, reign supreme. Um, so now I wanted to, to move on to more, more substantially my kind of main focus about British involvement in Colombia. Um, beginning in 1989, um, under the Thatcher government. So, I mean, the, the Thatcher government initiated a so-called war on drugs in Colombia. And I mean, at the time, Colombia was, um, you know, the greatest exporter of cocaine in the world. Um, so... I mean, British, British counter-narcotics assistance um, kind of continued. I mean, it still, still continued up until around 2010. And this entailed SAS assistance and training. Um, arms export licenses included heavy, for heavy machine guns, artillery, components for military helicopters. Um, and in Parliament in 1999, it was revealed that Britain was assisting Colombia with advisory visits and information exchanges on operations in urban theatres, counter strategy, and psychiatry. Um, so it's important to highlight the kind of level of cooperation and assistance coming from the British government um, to the Colombian um, state during this, during this period. Because, I mean, by, by 2000, Colombia was seen um, uh, by the UN as the Western Hemisphere's worst abuser of human rights. Um, there were countless massacres. There was um, wide-scale cooperation between the military and paramilitary organizations. Um, and, you know, this, this violence wasn't sporadic, it wasn't random. It was in the kind of particular pattern of repression, um, which was characterized by basically destroying any barrier to um, foreign, well, or to private capital accumulation. Um, so what you had during these years is Colombia would consistently compile one of the worst tolls um, for trade unionists, uh, for, sorry, the killings of trade unionists. For, for many of these years, more trade unionists killed in Colombia than the rest of the world combined. Um, so, so you see, while, while Britain was claiming to be fighting this war on drugs and it was yielding no results whatsoever, I mean, uh, the price of cocaine on the streets in the UK uh, was not rising, um, the purity was not falling. And at the same time, Britain is contributing to this pattern of political violence that is um, quite useful for foreign, um, for foreign corporations. And simultaneously to this, British Petroleum becomes um, Colombia's largest direct foreign investor. So you've got a situation where the British government is kind of fueling, uh, fueling the fire of political violence in Colombia at the same time as British corporations are profiting massively. Um, so to, just to move on to what's kind of going on more recently with regards to the conservative government um, and what they're up to in Latin America. So I want to start with Brazil. Um, so as many, many of the listeners will be aware, the Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, is, is a kind of neo-fascist character. He's called for the massacre of leftists. He said Brazil would function much better uh, um, if, say, 40,000 uh, leftists would be massacred. He's 
he's been quite nostalgic about the reinstallment of a dictatorship. I mean, he's homophobic, sexist, racist. He's, you know, the uh, picture of a, uh, a general bigot. And I mean, the, the British government has, has known pretty, well, will have known pretty well who uh, Bolsonaro is. Um, they'll know who they've been dealing with, uh, just like, I mean, various other despots in the Middle East, etc. So um, myself, Natalia Orban and Daniel Hunt of Brazil Wire have found that the, the, the Tory government in just the past few years has been collaborating with the Rio state governor, Wilson Witzel. And Rio at the moment is, is, is quite a part of um, violence, especially police, um, uh, police initiated violence. So at the moment, there's a higher police gun mortality rate in Rio than there is in most other US states for gun mortality in general, not just police gun mortality. Um, and so the conservative government, according to Freedom of Information requests that we receive, has been helping Witzel with um, security assistance, such as biometric facial recognition cameras. Um, we also found that the, the, the UK diplomats and foreign office officials had been meeting with um, the Bolsonaros months before the 2018 Brazilian general election. Um, this was at a time when Bolsonaro was only polling roughly 15, 16 percent. He wasn't a well. He was, he was a well-known character, but he wasn't. He wasn't a respected character in any way, and he, there wasn't really any... Um, people didn't expect him to win at this point in April 2018 when he was meeting with uh, foreign office um, officials. Now, Liz Truss arrived. Liz Truss, now the architect of free trade deals, um, who's been kind of uh, go, going around trying to secure the best post-Brexit free trade deals for, the, for Britain, um, she arrived in Brazil the day before the foreign office meetings with the Bolsonaros, and we're fairly sure that she was present at the time as well. Um, and what we've seen, I mean, quite predictably, uh, since Bolsonaro was elected, is a kind of fire sale of Brazil's natural resources. Um, and and British, British multinationals, once again, have profited from this, like BP and Shell, for instance. Uh, their interests are growing in, in Brazil. And Anglo-American, sorry, Anglo-American similarly is, um, has sent in, uh, I believe, 30 re separate requests to mine on indigenous protected territory, just as Bolsonaro is uh, kind of limiting restrictions on what can be done on indigenous land in Brazil. Uh, so once again, you have the British government um, both collaborating with extreme right-wing forces in Latin America, but also reaping the rewards afterwards. Um, but just to just to finish on Venezuela, um, which is perhaps the most prescient um, issue at the moment, especially given the, the recent coup attempt um, led by US, U.S. and Venezuelan mercenaries. Um, so since I mean, since Juan Guaido pronounced himself as interim president um, of Venezuela, the, the British government has been consistently um, offering him support. The British government was one of the first states to recognise Guaido. Um, in January 2019, the Foreign Office requested the Bank of England to, uh, to freeze Venezuelan assets around $1.4 billion worth of gold. Um, and just today, I've released an article via the Canary um, relating to a Foreign Office unit that hasn't priorly been revealed by either the government or the Foreign Office, named the Venezuela Reconstruction Unit. Um, and this 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 unit um, is headed by the the former UK ambassador to Venezuela, John Saville. Um, and so we asked we asked the Foreign Office what the what the actual reason for the existence of this unit is, and they responded saying this is you know just to help out with the dire um, political and economic situation in Venezuela. However, there's it doesn't seem to square with the reason that they kept it entirely secret. Um, and as well that it's within the, the Foreign Office rather than, say, the, the Department for International Development through which all these kind of humanitarian um, assistance, in inverted commas, programmes usually get funnelled. Um, and we also found private discussions between Juan Guaido's UK representative, Vanessa Neumann, and UK officials um, talking about sustaining British business interests in Venezuela in a post-coup era. So what we can see is the Foreign Office planning um, planning in advance for how bi uh, British business is going to reap the rewards in a post-coup um, post era. Now, just to 
talk about some alternatives to the kind of um, neoliberalism that's that spread across Latin America over the past 40 or 50 years. Um, so I spent three weeks, sorry, just to add to this, by the time Guaido um, had visited the UK in January 2020, um, there was already a plan underway, uh, backed by the US um, mercenary group Silver, Silver Corp USA. And part of the contract that was signed by Guaido um, entailed, and let me just quote, there were orders to kill anybody deemed to be armed and violent colectivos. Now, colectivos has been um, quite a, uh, what's the word? I mean, the colectivos tr translated simply, it, it translates as a collective, as a group of people. Um, and it's been used, especially within the right-wing media, as a kind of catch-all uh, to kind of dirty social organisations within Venezuela to uh, display them as these kind of fanatic terrorists um, or fanatically violent, that they're um, comprehensively armed and dangerous, et cetera. Um, so, so what you see within, within this contract that had been signed by the, by the time that Guaido had visited the UK was this kind of call or this uh, carte blanche to attack um, social organisations within Venezuela, which are usually peaceful um, working class communities that are organising various different ways to sustain themselves um, um, in, in, in what is definitely an economic crisis there at the moment. So I just wanted to finish by talking about my experience of Colectivos while I was in Venezuela between March and, um, March and April 2019. So I stayed with the leader of a Colectivo um, for two weeks um, in one of the poor areas of Caracas. And I mean, this, this was not the picture of um, violent, um, dangerous pro-government forces that they've been totally depicted at across the, uh, across, across the Western media. And um, this particular colectivo, Guardianes de Libertador, Guardians of the Liberator, um, was basically just designed to help kids in the local area um, find things for them to do um, or, uh, different organizations, they had a theater class, they had a dance class, etc. cetera. Um, but there are also different ways that Venezuelans have managed to organize themselves in the face of uh, economic warfare from the US, um, but also obviously economic difficulties from the drop in oil prices. So I visited one, um, com one, one community that was organizing their own food distribution process altogether. They'd cut out the shops, many of them which are privately owned, um, and they, they were charging exorbitant rates for foods, for the main foods that Venezuelans needed at the time. So they were going straight um, directly to the producers, to the farmers. They were buying it in bulk together to lower the price for themselves. They were cutting out all of the, all of the, the kind of um, the market relations in the middle of going to the shops, of um, paying the employees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that way they managed to, they managed to save, um, well, their food costs roughly 25% of what it otherwise would have costed. And if people didn't have the money, they'd figure out ways to, um, to, to, go, to go through different avenues to, to buy together, et cetera. And um, so, I mean, there's, there's various forms of different social organization happening in Venezuela right now that you, you won't see occurring in the, in the corporate media whatsoever. Um, and, in, I mean, in a sense, you saw a lot of this organisation happening in, in response to coronavirus in the UK. Um, as soon as a crisis hit, many communities were getting together to figure out a way to ride it out together. Um, and that has been romanticised in the UK, rightfully so. It's a good thing. However, when this is reported about Venezuela, you're accused of ex exoticising uh, people's struggles. Um, when really, really the case is these are communities that are committed to the sovereignty of their own nation. Um, the legitimacy of their own government and um, their right to exist without being oppressed and without being threatened by the United States. So just to, and I mean, just to add to that, I mean, if you look at Bolivia right now as a, as a result of the coup, mm. I mean, the, the, kind of, the kind of racism, um, the, the economic uh, reforms that have gone on under the Anya's government <clears throat> and the violence against certain communities, is what you, you could expect to see in Venezuela should the US get its way in overthrowing the government. So yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up there.
No, thanks very much indeed uh, for that. That's, that's been really, really helpful. Thank you. And uh, I'm particularly interested in what you were saying about Venezuela, the, the reportage on Venezuela and indeed Latin America across the piece really by the, the mainstream media has been absolutely appalling. And it's interesting you mentioned the, the government's uh, uh, role and uh, talking about uh, addressing the economic situation in Venezuela. One of the first things they ought to be doing is calling for the sanctions to be removed and the you'll i'm sure remember uh, alfred desaius the uh, un special rapporteur said that the sanctions against venezuela could amount to crimes against humanity and what we never hear about as well of course is the huge strides that were made in venezuela in terms of uh, eradicating uh, illiteracy in the country after seven years after uh, chavez came to power in 1998 uh, the massive reductions in, in poverty that were brought about, investment in housing. It's not to say it's not got its problems, it's got huge problems, but they're not eased or helped in any way, shape or form by these appalling sanctions and the misrepresentation of Venezuela that's been going on. I mean, I think what we should be doing is, is celebrating the fact that they've made such progress. And what I think is incredibly inspiring about, for me, uh, in relation to Venezuela, is the way in which the people... Uh, you know, have resisted the impact of the, the sanctions, uh, have come together. And I think we could learn a lesson or two, uh, certainly in terms of the, the, the grassroots movement that we're trying to build now uh, in this country. Uh, we could learn a lesson or two from Venezuela, the way in which they mobilized and inspired uh, communities in, in the barrios and so on to come together to get behind the, you know, the democratic revolution that took place. And he also mentioned, of course, uh, Brazil and, uh, you know, Lula da Silva and the Workers' Party and the huge strides that they made in addressing poverty and uh, improving living standards for the poorest people. And of course, Bolivia is, you know, yet another example. There are many, many examples, I think, across uh, Latin America. And uh, there was, you know, talk, uh, wasn't there in, in the early 2000s, you know, the pink tide that was sweeping uh, across the continent there, you know, the Bol Bolivarian revolution, if you like, that was, was that was taking the continent by storm. But it just demonstrates the 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 the, the strength of the powers that we're up against. You know, the kind of uh, imp the imperialist instincts of the of the corporations. You know, the corporate sector uh, and places like you know the United States, obviously Britain and uh, and other Western uh, countries uh, certainly knows no bounds. And and it, it really illustrates, I think, the importance of as uh, you know demonstrating our solidarity uh, internationally you know with the the the, the, the people in uh, latin america because uh, clearly their their interests have not been served by the imposition of of neoliberalism and the rolling back of the pink tide that was sweeping the continent in the 2000s and and what's encouraging i think is that there is still a very strong social movements that you've identified in your presentation john and uh, you know that we can take hopefully uh, strength from that and inspiration from that as we move forward to try and address you know the issues in in this country but our next speaker is is george lambie and uh, george's academic career spanned at warwick and de montfort universities where he designed and taught a degree in globalization and international business uh, he's also run international cooperation projects and was a co-director with cuba's minister of finance in the first major collaboration between cuba and the european commission He's currently a visiting professor at the universities of Dresden and Hong Kong, where he runs courses in Latin American politics and international political economy. His copious publications include a book that's particularly relevant to tonight's discussion, entitled The Cuban Revolution in the 21st Century. So over to you, George, if you could uh, speak for 10 or 15 minutes. And then, as I say, we'll take some questions from uh, the viewers. You just need to un unmute your mic, George, before you start. George is just unmuted. The mic. Ah, you got it. We got you now, George. We can hear you. you got me. Okay, right. Okay, unmuted by the host. No, it's all right. It's all well. Apologies about that. My technological skills are not brilliant. Okay, um, don't worry. <laughs> what I'd like to do, rather than comment directly on Latin America, because I think we've got a very good representation of Latin America from John and, and the comments made by yourself, I'd like to have a, a contextual dimension, really referring back to your perspective on neoliberalism and so on. And I'd like to also introduce globalization as well, which is obviously part of that process. I also think back as well for the context of this debate that both Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez believed that the revolution or the struggle was a battle for ideas. And so that's the sort of context I want to talk in about uh, at the moment. Uh, my subject is international political economy. I'm not going to spend lengths boring you with this, but I'm going to mention why I think it's quite relevant to the debate that we're having now and other debates. 
is because we feel as international political economists that one of the problems is with academia, it becomes embedded. It also becomes separated. For example, you have politics, economics, sociology, a whole series of disciplines that have been fragmented. And as political economists, we believe that we want to go back to the original political philosophers and, and the political economists and actually start to look at things in a more sort of eclectic view. Because the problem is academia, for example, uh, deals with problem solving theories. If you're an economist, then how do you solve these certain problems? If you're a, a political scientist, you look at politics as though the contestation between parties, individuals and so on, voting, etc. But from a, an international political economy point of view, what we look at is the system and why systems change. And I think this is a crucial moment in history at the moment when the system is changing. That system of neoliberalism is failing dramatically. Uh, as we know, globalization itself, and particularly the unipolar world that was set up after Fukuyama's idea of, uh, you know, the end of history, that is also failing. And I think in the context of that failure, it opens up a lot of opportunities. Um, what I'd like to go on and say is just say a little bit about globalization, because I think contextualizing globalization is quite important, because then we can see out the other end what the possibilities might be. From our point of view, or my point of view as an international political economist, um, globalization is something that was not created by new technologies, not created by oh, just uh, the course of history, or not just simply a phase of capitalism, even though it is. It was something that was developed in intentionality. Groups of financiers, uh, corporate executives, um, a whole changing system, deregulation of finance and so on. And they actually then associated with add-ons. Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan represented this force that was already go on, going on. And also the economists that you talked about, uh, Milton Friedman and all the rest of them, I believe they came up with a convenient ideology which to attach to the notion of globalization. What does globalization do? How does it become relevant in our debate? It is the case of power being transferred outside the nation. It's complete antithesis of what went before of embedded liberalism, the Keynesian social democratic period, where a whole uh, swathe of power is moved into transnational space. And by transnational space, I mean extra geographical space, where the nation state, Susan Strange, one of our uh, most famous international political economists said, where, where the nation used to, or where the state used to rule the market, the market now rules the state. And I think this is where our problem lies with globalization. You have this enormous depth of power that lies in transnational space. And so these transnational actors are no longer responsible to nation states. And we can see this as much in the United States as we can see it in Haiti. Tremendous poverty in the United States, increasing poverty even in Haiti, because essentially these groups of people are now just using the global system as a resource and cherry picking what they need, be it cheap labor or be it whatever, dumping kind of polluting things into the atmosphere or into the environment and so on. And they exist in this kind of independent space. And this is a tremendous problem that we've got to challenge because these people who run the global system really have, I would say, very little consideration for the well-being of the peoples in nations. And so it leaves a tremendous challenge that lies ahead for us. But how do, in some ways, we begin to address this challenge? Well, of course, some of the things that have been uh, mentioned, like Hugo Chavez, for example, in Venezuela. Now, what was special for me about Hugo Chavez in Venezuela is because Venezuela didn't produce bananas, what it might produce. If you it didn't produce some sort of cash crop, it produced oil. And when Chavez captured that resource and started diverting it towards the population, just simply being a profit stream for corporations and the internal oligarchy, then he became an enormous challenge to this transnationalized system because essentially what he was doing, he was seeking a degree of power in a commodity that was absolutely essential to the international system. Now, I'd like to say a little bit more about Latin America as well, because one of the confusions that comes out of this is democracy and dictatorship. It's a very well-known fact that the United States uh, in the past, certainly after the Second World War, and the notions by George Kennan and so on, you know, why bother with democracy and all these things as power politics, is that Latin America was put in a position where if the corporations were not well treated, like in Chile, then uh, dictators were put in place, even in a country like uh, Brazil, Joe Goulart was kicked out of power, a social democratic leader. Now, I would argue on this new globalized transnational system, you don't need the dictators anymore. You might at some stage later on, because essentially what has happened is that the states in Latin America have been liquidated. Those states have had their assets moved out to corporations, things have been privatized, the decision-making process now lies outside the nation state to a large extent. Uh, for example, in Venezuela, 
uh, during the period of great austerity in the 1980s, uh, there was such an amount of capital flight going out of Venezuela and there's more than the capital coming in from loans. So you create a situation where Latin America becomes, if you like, asset stripped and gutted. And so when someone like Lula comes to power in Brazil, poverty actually increases under Lula. It doesn't get better, not because he wanted it, not because his policies were bad, because of his inability to control both transnational capital and also the internal oligarchies, which are no longer so much oligarchies that are just based on kind of ranchers and export into the UK or whatever. But these oligarchies have now become a subset of the transnational elite, or what William Robinson calls the transnational capitalist class. And this subset now are more interested in their Miami real estate and their bank accounts in Switzerland and so on than they are particularly in their home economies. Of course, they still start to make profit out of it. And so, on. so what I would argue is that this whole debate about democracy as well, which we can bring into this, is that democracy can, of course, flourish in Latin America for the simple reason that when governments come to power, they have hardly any control over the economy because that economy has been deregulated and spread into transnational space. So these democracies, I would argue, again, quoting William Robinson as one of the people from political economy, are polyarchies, where a powerful group of people uh, come to power. There's very little choice in the elections, essentially, because so much economic power is outside of the reach of the, of the politicians. And therefore, what happens is basically you can revolve the governments and put new governments in all the time, but you still get the same recipe. You still get the same treatment. Now, Hugo Chavez broke that mold completely. And that's why, in my view, he became so reviled and so attacked by the outside world, because he truly did offer a threat to this transnationalized system. He was one of the first leaders that was beginning to divert power back to the nation state and divert power back to the people. Uh, I was involved in Venezuela in 2006-07 doing a study on the healthcare system, which basically the Cubans were building. At one point, there were 10,000 Cubans in Venezuela attempting to build uh, a viable healthcare system. And I've got some, you know, in my book on Cuba, I write quite a little bit about this. Uh, and to me, this was one of the most important means of resistance against this transnational capitalist class or whatever you want to call them, or this offshoring of power among this group of people who have little consideration for the well-being of nation states. In fact, they've almost abandoned them, something which uh, Samuel, Samuel Palmisano, the former head of IBM, he said, you know, that the transnational corporation now has very little to do with nation states. It just uses them for its resources, etc. But what Chavez did was, I think, uh, an enormous attempt to try and uh, divert those resources to the population and also at the same time, he attempted to raise the consciousness of the population, not just by distributing goods and being paternal to them, but also involving them in the processes of, of building up kind of control of factories, a whole series of other things, um, you know, the various groups that John's talked about. These are all things which I believe started to build up a, a degree of understanding and resistance. And what I'd like to do to finish off, I'm not going to say much more because I hope things come out in the questions, is I'd like to take a quote from... Uh, a former colleague and friend of mine, who unfortunately died some years ago, a Cuban socialist called Fernandez Heredia. And he says, socialism is a process of successive upheavals, not only in the economy, politics, and ideology, but in conscious and organized action. It is a process premised on unleashing the power of the people who learn to change themselves along with their circumstances. Revolutions within the revolution demand creativity and unity with respect to principles and organizations and broad and growing participation. In other words, they must become a gigantic school through which people learn to direct social processes. Socialism is not constructed spontaneously, nor is it something that can be bestowed. And I would say as a parting word on this, that this construction of globalization is put there is not natural. It is something that is constructed in intentionality and it is formed and particularly its power is derived not only from its control of economics, the deregulated finances running around the world to very little purpose as a model of accumulation. I think it's completely broken, but also the fact that they control the ideas through the mass media, five big corporations basically control the media. Nobody will know so well as you, Chris, when you were on the television program and you were talking about Venezuela, you know, my heart bled for you, you did a brilliant job. Mm. But the media is, you know, absolutely something which we've got to transcend in some ways if we're going to get people to be conscious of what needs to be done to change their circumstances. Mm. So I'll leave it there. 
No, thanks very much indeed. Really, really interesting. Thank you for that, George, and really appreciate your contribution this evening. And hopefully we'll get some uh, interesting questions coming in. And uh, I think one of the points you made about the globalised nature of, uh, of uh, corporate power hasn't been matched by globalised sort of worker power in that sense. And uh, what I think we, in our small way, are started to try and do, and this is why the movement that we are trying to create is a very strongly anti-imperialist movement. Uh, not simply focused on the issues concerning you know, workers, people in Britain, important, of course, though that is, but to also have that internationalist perspective and to, uh, you know, to kind of feel like learn some of the lessons uh, as to the way in which, you know, corporate power has been, been abused. And the very fact that, you know, this globalization agenda has had a direct implication, a direct impact on workers in this country, because we've seen our jobs I mean, I look, when I left school in Derby as a young sort of 15 year old working class kid, there were about 120,000 people in Derby alone working in the manufacturing sector. Rolls Royce employed 35,000 people. The railway, a similar number, 20,000, sorry, not, not 35, but 20,000. Selenese, a similar number. Selenese doesn't exist. It's been raised to the ground. The railway is a shadow of its former self. Uh, Rolls-Royce is still the biggest employer, but it's a third of its size in terms of workforce. But many of those jobs have gone overseas. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, new technology uh, has uh, taken some of them, but, but that's not the main cause. The main cause is the fact that jobs have gone away from this country and they've been allowed to do that. And that's been a real uh, problem, it seems to, to me, and, and something that we need international collaboration uh, and uh, to try and counter that mainstream media, you know, through things like social media, through things what like we're doing today and, and sort of building those links. But let me go to some uh, questions, if I uh, can. And um, they're coming in thick and fast now. But the first one is um, from a, a woman called Diane, Diane Drew. She said, do you think that the UK's adherence to neoliberalism has contributed to needless deaths in the UK from COVID-19? What do you think uh, on that? Uh, John, do you want to kick off with that one? You have to un un unmute yourself <laughs> on that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, without any shadow of a doubt, I mean, we had um, statistics come through, I believe, two years ago that said there was 140,000 excess deaths as a direct um, cause of austerity, eight years of austerity in the UK at that time. Um, but also, I mean, within, I mean, austerity is, a, is one um, fig leaf of neoliberalism, I suppose. And as a, as a result of Tory cuts to the hospital system, um, but not just to the hospital system, to various different, um, various different um, um, kind of health, um, health aspects as well, sports community centres, and just the general well-being of, uh, of working people in this country over the past 10 years has totally uh, depreciated. Um, and here we have a situation where at the root end of, of 10 years of austerity, we have the second highest death toll at the moment. They believe it's above 50,000 people now. Um, and there's absolutely no way you can disconnect the two processes, the, the 10 years of austerity and, and what we're seeing now as a result of, of um, the coronavirus. Any thoughts on that, George? And, uh, and while you're uh, at it, could you also uh, perhaps comment on, on a further question that we've uh, uh, had to come in saying, uh, how do we kickstart the revolution in the midst of this virus? Any thoughts on that, George, and, and the previous? Uh... Yeah, well, I'll go for the first one. I agree entirely with you know, John's comments on um, on COVID nineteen. I, I think also, you know, it, austerity obviously is, is the crucial thing, but I think there's something else missing as well, and that is the loss of public ethos. The fact that public administrators these days, you know, there's been privatisation, there's been new public management, and so you know, public services have been increasingly driven towards the business angle and and, and really measured by business criteria and so on. And I've just come back from Hong Kong, and you might think it's peculiar, but they had a British administration system. I don't think it's actually changed from the one that was kind of taught to them in the 1960s. And you might criticise Hong Kong on many fronts, but they've got a damn good public administration. They've still got a public ethos. And you look at their performance with COVID-19, it's excellent. And I've been there and witnessed it. So 
I think what we've lost is we've, we've got austerity, we've got the whole neoliberal program, and they're definitely in there, they're 80% of the problem. But there's also another big percentage of the problem. I think that public administrators, and I wouldn't want to say anything about the NHS, I think the men and women who work for it are doing a brilliant job and the best they can, but we've got to remember they've faced austerity, they've faced cuts, they've faced all sorts of changes, which have put them in a very bleak position for taking on a pandemic like this. So I would say, you know, let us try and get back to responsible, public administration, which really has a public objective. It's not a pseudo business. What about kickstarting the revolution? Uh, That's the- always a good question. Yeah, well, I'll go back to my battle for ideas. I think that, you know, it is persuading people of ideas, but there is a link, there's a symbiotic link, you know, as Gramsci would say, between really lived experience and ideas. And I think this, what this virus will do is it will, it obviously is very unfortunate and so on, but it, I can't see us exiting from this, I wish it were possible. Um, You know, first of all, we had a crisis before the virus, a very deep crisis. And it's unfortunate it's come now because it's going to deepen that crisis even further. It will create all sorts of austerity. It will reveal, if you like, you know, the shiny car that's been painted with a nice coat of paint will suddenly find that nothing works inside it. The engine doesn't work anymore. You know, it's all falling to pieces. And I think this is going to be the result of this virus. It's going to make people start thinking very seriously about the managers of the economy and about the government and the way that the country's been run for the past 30 years. Mm. John, have we got any lessons to learn in relation to that question about uh, kickstarting the uh, revolution um, from the Gilets Jaunes, from the Yellow Vest movement that you've been reporting on? I mean, they we've hardly heard much about it. I mean, notable exception with your fantastic reporting for the Canary and others. Um, we've heard very little about the Yellow Vest movement on the mainstream uh, media, but they, again, are another source of inspiration, certainly to me. And I followed it uh, you know, fairly closely. And, uh, you know, before the COVID-19 crisis anyway, I mean, I think they were on the street for well over, every week for well over a year and um, huge mass rallies. And they seemed really to have brought uh, people from all strata, really, of the community together. You know, I remember seeing um, one protest where I think there were ballet dancers performing uh, for the crowd, another one where there was a philharmonic orchestra uh, similarly uh, doing uh, likewise and sort of bringing, you know, bringing arts and culture together and, and really making a kind of, uh, you know, carnival atmosphere. And of course, and they are very much challenging, are they not, the neoliberal reforms that Macron is trying to inflict on the French uh, people. I wonder, what do you, what's your thoughts about that, John? You've obviously been reporting from it. I mean, do they give us a, a blueprint for how we perhaps could uh, follow suit in this country? Yeah, they definitely uh, offer a certain form of blueprint. Um, I mean, at the time, just to expand on what kind of um, economic situation they were in at the time, um, Macron was trying to force through a pension reform that ma- the majority of French people didn't uh, accept whatsoever. Um, and simultaneously to this general strike against the pension reform, you had the Gilets Jaunes or the Yellow Vests, who were, I believe, I, I forget now, up to that, roughly around their 60th week, I believe their 67th week of a con- continuous protest every single Saturday, which is... I believe the longest running uh, continuous protests in uh, Western European history, as much as we know anyway. And so it's really quite, the the longevity of it alone was really quite impressive. Now, when it came to what they were actually demanding, um, it it replicated more of a mass mass expression of contempt and disgust with what what the current situation in the country was. Um, And it was an... And that, that feeling was certainly shared. However, all these different groups were coming to the Yellow Vest with different perceptions of how it could change. However, they were all, all in certain agreement that, you know, the neoliberalism that Macron has pursued over the past, um, over the past few years uh, and, and, and his predecessors as well has been quite disastrous. Um, now, I wanted to, to just add uh, onto George's former point about how this is going to kind of change the way people, kind of change the way people perceive politics, the coronavirus, um, I mean, it's, for me, it's highlighted three crucial things. One, that public services are crucial, and they're crucial as a public service, not as a private service. The second one is that the economy totally crumbles without workers. Um, and I don't think that was, that was um, especially apparent to everybody before this happened. But now that workers are, um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the CEOs, it's not the people at the top of businesses that we need to function the economy, as we've been told for so long. It's the people um, who are actually doing the work. Um, and thirdly, that public funds can be found. 
uh, for public necessities. Now, we were told in the, in, the, in the wake of Grenfell, for example, or various other absolute scandals in this country, that funds were not available to rehouse people, that um, funds were not, not available um, to fund public services as, as the educational system was going into a state of collapse. And there's not funds available for extra hospitals. Um, and now we've seen that the public funds can be made available just as they were after the Second World War to build the NHS. So I think there are three things that have become readily apparent in the face of this coronavirus. Um, that's going to change the way people kind of hopefully at least approach politics. Mm. Well, there's no doubt that the funds are available. I don't particularly want to get into that debate, but, uh, you know, they're absolutely... Look, we can't run out of money in this country because we have our own sovereign currency. It's all about political priorities. And as Tony Benn once said, if we can find money to kill people, we can find money to help people. And, and certainly, you know, we came out of the Depression uh, in uh, the 1930s as a consequence of the Second World War through, through rearmament and so on, through, through government investment. And I think that was a point that Tony w was making there. And as a lesson, I think that we need to, to take into peacetime as well. Can I just move on and perhaps we'll say this one to, to George, if I can. And uh, it's from Mohammed. And he said, that, why do you think the Pink Tide governments failed to defend themselves from overthrow by domestic and international forces, despite the long history overthrow of leftists and social democratic governments uh, throughout the region. Any well, thoughts, George, on that one? Well, yes, I mean, I think, that, you know, the pink tide governments were, were quite logical in, in, in the context, really. And, and uh, probably, you know, the, the, the strongest position was on, under the, the, the Bolivarian structure, ALBA, which was based by Cuba and Venezuela, which was actually going to set up an alternative structure in Latin America. Uh, you know, with different forms of financing. In fact, Telesur, which is still running these days, you know, was a, a different culture, television, media station and so on. Um, I think the Pink Tide governments, um, you know, have not really survived because it is so difficult, going to my, my point before, that power is now in transnational space. And so you could get a leader like Lula, you could get very positive leaders. You know, we leave Chavez on one side because he captured Venezuela's major resource. But a lot of the other gov gov um governments and politicians could come to power, but how much could they do? Because actually economic power is controlled outside of the country. So I think the pink tide was, was a very good move. It was a very positive time, but there were limitations on what politicians can do precisely because their power is curtailed by this transnationalization process. So is it despair then that you are... Uh, no, I think, I think the thing, the, one of the things that was said to me in Cuba at the time about Hugo Chavez after the coup and when Chavez prevailed, you know, which was yes. just, you know, a great moment, as you've probably even seen the, 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 the documentary on it. Yes, I have, yes. Is that he was advised by certain people that he should move on to really kind of, you know, purge the military and also to put some of the oligarchs and the media in prison. And he said, no, you know, this is 21st century socialism we have to live with. And, and, you know, in some ways I admire Chavez for doing this, but, you know, there is a very big difference between the right to, gov to govern and the power to govern. And I think the problem with the Pink Tide governments was twofold. One is the transnationalization of economic power, which they had no real hold over. And secondly, the system, the oligarchs, the power structures were never challenged by them. I mean, the very fact that he didn't take the action that you suggested he was advised to do gives the lie to the fact that he's some sort of tyrannical, monstrous dictator. And oh, uh, course, I think you know, he, he was the most exemplary Democrat. Very much so, very history. much so. And, uh, you know, <laughs> well, you I, I think it's important. It's an absolute tragedy that, that he died so young, only 58 years of age. And, uh, you know, who knows? Clearly, you know, the downturn and... Uh, in the in the in the oil price etc would have had an impact but you know and obviously it's been very difficult for nicolas maduro uh to to carry on uh the um you know the the, the work that that uh, Ch chavez was was doing because it's obviously very different circumstances but it would be interesting just to see how uh, hugo, hugo Chavez would have would have responded but incredible work that he did but just in relation to that there's a there's a question that uh, that's come in uh from somebody saying um can you please tell the viewers that the electronic voting in Venezuela was not rigged as the West said it was uh, and is overseen by legitimate vote watchers from all over the world? In fact, I think, didn't uh, Jimmy Carter say it was the safest um, election that he'd observed anywhere in the world, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken? John, do you want to come in on this one? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, Venezuela has one of the most advanced voting systems in the world. It um, implemented electronic voting much before many other countries. 
Um, the 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 election in question for Maduro after um, Chavez died. Um, there were international various different teams from various diff from numerous different continents of international observers, all who confirmed that the election uh, was not um, was not rigged. It was free and fair. Um, but you only need to look as far as Bolivia recently to see the way in which this kind of narrative is spun in advance of elections and then after elections by various different organisations that are linked to the US. In this case, it was the Organisation of American States, the OAS. Um, but just to, just to juxtapose Venezuela's voting system to that of the US, we've recently seen the Democratic primary that was riddled with various different complications. Um, certain votes didn't come in um, till much later than they were expected. Um, Bernie Sanders' um, uh, predicted votes were vote tallies were, were wildly off what actually occurred. Now I'm not I'm not out uh, out and out suggesting that there was voter fraud, but as well as that, I mean, for a U.S. presidential election, you have a large pr proportion of the Afro African American population in jail. Many others are disenfranchised because they have been jailed. Um, so, I mean, the, the level of voter disenfranchisement in the U.S., yeah. in my opinion, is much, much worse than that of Venezuela. Uh, the yeah, U.S. No, has absolutely, the, yeah. You know, the U.S. have got no room to uh, lecture anybody, it seems to me, on on democracy and, uh, and election. Uh, and, and just in terms of their own, never mind their own domestic uh, electoral arrangements, the way in which they've, you know, imposed dictators on the world, the way they've overthrown democratically elected governments, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of legendary, isn't it? The, the, you know, the numbers, I mean, right across the piece, you know, uh, uh, so they, they've got no room to, to talk at all. Uh, look, we're getting, we're getting overwhelmed with questions. So let me just put three, which are kind of sort of linked. Uh, the first one's from, from Andrew, and I perhaps have asked George if you could maybe come in and then come back to John, give John a bit of a breather. Uh, this one's from Andrew uh, Menem, and he's saying, what can we do to bring the broad spectrum of the British public views together with uh, we we bring together with we have workers arguing amongst themselves over things like fast food workers what fast food workers should be paid and uh, and uh, michael o'shea is saying is there anything specific he could do to show solidarity with social movements and social uh, uh, and socialist states and then finally uh, ben ben williams is saying uh, he works um, in a school for special needs children their disabilities are both physical and mental. May I ask uh, what the panel think about schools of these types being opened in June following the government proposal? So uh, sort of a, a range of different uh, uh, contributions there. George, do you want to sort of kick off with some of those? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, sorry, what was the second one that you said? I wanted to answer. This was uh, about Ma Michael was saying, is there anything specific he wants to know? Is there anything specific he could do to show solidarity with social movements and socialist states? Well, I think the most important thing we can do in some ways is to is to try and reveal the truth, is to try and, you know, get the evidence to to say, well, this sort of information, you know, this reporting is not accurate. I mean, there are so many false reports that come out of the mainstream media, which are supported by, you know, across the media spectrum. I mean, again, I refer to your um, your session on the news, really, you know, your attempt to actually, you know, lay down what the facts were and the reality of the situation, you know, was broadly condemned by the, the interviewer, which was, you know, these are the sort of challenges we've got to take. We have not got to believe the fake news, basically. We've got to try and find out the truth about things. Sometimes the truth might be slightly ugly. It might not be exactly what we want, but we need to find out what the real situation is, because so many of these things are now fabricated. Yeah. Any comments on uh, anything else then? Or John, shall we go to you, John? Any comments you've got to make on those three questions that were just posed there? Yeah, I'd absolutely concur um, with what George just said. As an example, uh, with regards to Venezuela, I mean, you spoke about the different social progress it made and the different forms of social progress it made um, uh, in terms of education, health, living standards, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the University of Cardiff did a statistical analysis of the BBC's reporting on Venezuela, and they found in something over 350 articles, these, uh, this progress was only mentioned on three different occasions. Uh, so one of, the, one of the ways that you, we, can, you know, we can confront um, or we can support uh, social movements in Latin America and show solidarity with them is simply by learning uh, the actual truth of what's going on. And the only way you can do that is through various forms of independent media, it seems. Um, if the BBC is, is that ludicrously bad 
are reporting what's going on uh, in Latin America and various different countries across the world, then we need to figure out ways to support independent media that's going to bypass um, this, this nonsense, basically. What about the questions about bringing uh, the British public um, together and, uh, you know, and uh, sort of workers, um, you know, fast food workers and so on, and, and, and sort of trying to, I suppose, bring about a sense of, of solidarity with, with, with each other's struggles. And that's kind of sort of tangentially linked to Ben's uh, comments about um, the government requiring uh, schools to, uh, or potentially requiring schools to, to reopen. Uh, what's your thoughts on, on that? I know the sort of well, I think, you know, looking at that, we, we, we need to kind of, you know, have counter hegemonic ideas, the dominant ideas that, you know, markets work and neoliberalism, individualism, all these sort of mythological structures that are out there that are taken as given. I think we always be constantly battling against those, you know, solidarity among people to achieve things, uh, bring back a responsible state. Um, bring back democratic processes, particularly at the local level, so you can vote for people who really represent the majority of interests. So I, I think, you know, it's fighting in some ways as a starter for what we used to have in a way, is for, you know, responsible local government, democracy that has some impact, and, you know, common purpose can be built through that mechanism, I think. Any, any thoughts on the, on the school situation? Not totally linked to what we, but the question's been posed. Well, I... I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure about it. It, it. This is partly a science question, okay? If you were talking about the economy, I'd say they want, will want to rush things along because they're worried the economy is already failing in a failing system. So, um, but I think with the issue of schools, I, I'm just not sure about that. I, I, I can't I can't comment, um, you know, authoritatively on that. Okay, no worries. Then. Let me move on then to, we've only got a couple of three minutes left now, but to Kirsty saying, how do we challenge further austerity when there's so many people saying we can't challenge the government? A quick response to that, John. One one of the most powerful parts of um, neoliberalism and Margaret Thatcher's legacy is the, the is the belief among working people that there is actually no alternative. So uh, one of one of the main reasons is to is to find different ways to resist. Um, I mean, at the moment, the most important thing I would suggest that you can do is to join a trade union, seeing as the government nor the bosses actually care about your life and are forcing you to go back to work in dangerous conditions. Um, so yeah, that's that's my brief response. Any thoughts on that, George? I think throw the efficiency myth straight back at them and say, mm -hmm. look how incredibly inefficient you're running the system by diverting lots of support to international bankers and financiers and supporting a group of elites through tax cuts and so on. So there's plenty of money. There's socialism for the rich, but you know, hey, what about you know ordinary people having a bite of this cake as well? You know, I think actually throw it back to them and say, well, the system you've created is inefficient, it's created austerity, it's created economic decline, created a whole series of problems, which are going to be very difficult to get out of. There's an important question here, and given the, the increasingly bellicose rhetoric from uh, the Trump administration, um, somebody's asking a question here about whether they think, the panel thinks there could be war between Venezuela and the USA. In other words, will the USA take military action uh, directly against uh, Venezuela. What's your I, thoughts on I, that? Briefly. Oh, did you want to go John first? I don't mind. You've got the floor. You've got the floor, George. You quickly give an answer to uh, that. Okay. Thirty seconds. Well, I, I I don't think they will actually, because even though Venezuela's got the largest reserves of oil, and they started pricing oil outside of the dollar system, which is absolutely crucial, and they will invade countries if they do that, like Libya and Iraq. Is the point about Venezuela is they've got a tremendous amount of support from Russia and from China. In fact, Russia is already deeply embedded in uh, the oil system in Venezuela. So I would say it would be highly risky to invade. It would also not be a clever thing to do in an election year. No, indeed. And, and John, we've got about 30 seconds. What's your thoughts about war, military? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd widely agree with George. I just think um, the kind of uh, asymmetrical slash hybrid warfare against Venezuela via economic sanctions, via funding paramilitaries, via funding mercer sorry, mercenaries, and its neighbouring countries like Colombia and Brazil to uh, keep applying pressure on Venezuela will continue and just try and crush the government uh, by turning the people within the country against the government. OK, well, look, thanks very much indeed. Look, apologies to uh, everybody else who's asked questions. We have had time to, to ask them. We've been literally overwhelmed uh, with them, which I think is a testament to our two wonderful speakers. If we could give a, uh, a cyber uh, round of applause for, uh, for, for John and for, for George. I want to, to thank them both for being such interesting speakers and, and stimulating uh, such an overwhelming response. Thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in. 
and I hope to see you at the next uh, broadcast of Resistance TV. So thank you again and good night. Thank you.